Okay, let's begin, I think. How's everybody doing? Excellent. Uh, everybody's having a lot of fun with problem set four, I hear. Yes? Uh, all right, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so, okay, so let's, uh, let's get started and talk about some stuff here. Um, I think this XKCD comic is uh, a sort of appropriate for this. It's not about programming per se, but it is about uh, what makes you a computer expert. And I think, uh, I think it's got a good lesson in it there somewhere uh, about experimenting and uh, you know, asking someone who knows better and uh, the right balance between those two behaviors. So uh, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more with regard to the problem sets and such in just a second here. Um, so where we are today, just as a refresher, um, right now we are hopefully going to get through keyboard input and timing today. Uh, then we've got two more classes left this semester. So uh, hopefully we'll, that'll be enough time to get through reading and writing files and have a little bit of time left over for other stuff or um, just to sort of take our time with that or catch up on anything people aren't getting. Uh, so we may not get all the way through the keyboard and timing stuff today, but hopefully we'll get mostly through it. Okay, as for problem sets, uh, so at the current time, although I'm uh, willing to discuss options here, uh, problem set four is due tomorrow. Um, I'm almost done marking problem set three. I think people have overall done pretty well with problem set three. I've got a couple left to do, uh, but overall I think people did all right with it. Um, so this is stuff that could change a little bit. My plan was to put out problem set five on Thursday or Friday, which would be then due the 3rd of December, and then there's one last one uh, due the 14th of December. Again, now, if we have to move these a little closer together to give you a little more time on four, I'll make them a little bit simpler, you know, so they, you know, I'm trying to adjust these to take up the right amount of time and to be the right difficulty level, so uh, I'll, I'll take a step back if, you know, they're getting too hard. Um, and just to sort of remind you on you know, timings of things. I, I set the project proposal deadline due to the 18th of December. Again, you know, that is, it's 10% of your grade in this class, so that sort of tells you, like, that it's not an insubstantial amount of work, but it doesn't have to be, like, anything crazy. A couple, you know, a couple of pages of well-thought-out plans is plenty. Um, and people have been coming and talking about proposals for projects. And again, just to reiterate, you know, the plan is to do something that is a you know, is of big enough scope that you're doing it is worthy of 20% of your grade in this class. So, you know, something that is the size or at least requires the amount of effort that, you know, four or five problem sets might, might take over the course of next semester. So, um, you know, as I've told a lot of you individually, if you're doing a cognitive task, it sort of depends on what the cognitive task is, like how many features it makes sense to include or how complicated the task should be and so forth. Um, in order to make it a, a good project. So I encourage people to come talk to me about the details because um, what I'd you know, like to see is that you've thought about the kinds of things you might need to include. So like, you know, if you're doing a cognitive task, include how you're going to get information about the subject, like what you're going to record, you know, subject numbers and uh, accuracy and response time or, or whatever, you know, the task is, whether you're going to like write out uh, the, the information from each run as a file uh, whether you're going to do things in the program like do the randomization within your Python program or whether you're going to read in stimulus lists from a file or, you know, all kinds of things like that. Um, and again, you don't have to do all this stuff or you don't have to do a cognitive task at all. Um, you know, you could do a game, you could do some kind of data analysis or something like that. Uh, it really depends. And again, you know, the, if you're doing something that doesn't really push the boundaries of what we've already learned, uh, you know, I would expect a little something that's just a little bit longer, a little bit more effortful. If, if part of your project involves teaching yourself some things that we didn't talk about in class, um, then, you know, that's some effort in and of itself, just figuring that out. So, you know, it could be a somewhat simpler project if you had a lot of that kind of thing. Um, anyway, so again, I don't want this to be like overwork. I don't want you guys to freak out and stress about it. But I do, you know, I would recommend that you come and we can chat about like what makes what sounds like a good plan for a project. And then, you know, it'd be good to write a, a couple of pages of thoughtful plans about basically what you're going to have to include and what you'll have to learn in order to do your project. Okay, um, so a few notes from the last couple of problem sets. Again, I haven't looked at everyone's problem set, 03, enough to actually 
you know, be certain about uh, everyone's, but I've, I've looked at, I think, three quarters of them. So um, a few general notes uh, from problem set three, and maybe I'll actually quickly download a problem set four, but I didn't get problem set three, but let's quickly just look at that because there are a few, um, oops, there's a few items that I think it's worth talking about from problem set three that uh, pretty much everyone got wrong or didn't, uh, or didn't get exactly right anyway. Um, so I'm just going to download this as, this as a PDF because it looks a bit better. Okay, save. Uh, so one of the first problems that I think pretty much everybody um, got incorrectly is this one. Uh, so a lot of people had some interesting or, or good thinking that wasn't right, but I, I think I haven't seen one yet. I don't think that somebody actually got the correct answer here. Um, so the correct answer to this one is that it involves, yeah, I'll be posting the key to this soon, so you don't have to memorize this, but it involves the way that we import um, psychopy.visual.window versus the way that we import the function files that we've been writing. Um, I know we sort of glossed over it, but uh, you know, uh, we use the, imp the word import alone to import like psychopy.visual. But if you remember, at the top of all of our files, when we have our own little function file, we've been saying from my function file.py import star. Um, and there's a big difference there. So what I was sort of hoping is that you guys would have, we did, I did briefly mention this in class, uh, that there was a difference between these two things. So I was hoping you guys uh, would catch that and look up the difference between the from import versus the regular import. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't that big of a, a problem. It's just uh, that was something that everyone missed that I thought I should point out. Um, and it's not really critical for you to understand that difference, but this was a case where I was hoping you would, you know, look some stuff up online and figure it out uh, based on what clues you did have that we had been importing these things differently. Uh, another one, so, so again, you guys will all get individual feedback. It's not going to be as comprehensive as the first two problem sets. Um, but I really do encourage you to look at it because I should be telegraphing what are the things that I think you're getting and the things that I don't think you're getting that, you know, you should be paying attention to. Um, and I, pretty much everyone's problem set somewhere I said, look at the answers key for the right answer. Don't just ignore that. Like, I think you actually should look at the kinds of answers on the answer key that I'm expecting um, because that only, not only is good for the problem sets, but it's also probably good for the exam. So it'd be good for you, like, you're going to be getting similar types of questions on the exam. So if you want to know what sorts of answers I'm expecting on the exam in another semester, um, probably good to start thinking about what kinds of answers I'm expecting on the problem sets. Um, so that's just something to, to note. Um, so one thing that a lot of people got kind of right and kind of wrong was, uh, was this one. How many input arguments does draw me a circle take? Um, most people... Uh, I won't go into the code exactly, but most people answered the four variables. So most people got it correctly that it took four arguments, but most people answered the names of the variables from your main script that went into draw me a circle, not what they're called within draw me a circle, which is kind of a fine distinction and kind of not. So um, again, I think people should pay close attention to this one because if you didn't get this one right, I think what that suggests to me is that you kind of get how functions work, but you're still not totally getting it. So, um, so you should take a look at that and, and try to figure out what the difference is there. Um, so those were the two of the early ones. And people, people are doing pretty well, actually, with the questions about writing code. So what I'm noticing overall um, is that people, everyone pretty much, is tending to do better on the questions um, that involve you creating your own code and writing code or modifying code versus the questions that ask you, um, you know, a, a sort of verbal question to explain something or so forth. Um, and, you know, that, that suggests a couple of things. One is that I need to spend a little more time explaining the concepts on these, because I know we do, do go very quickly through this material. Uh, another could be that you guys are helping each other a little bit too much with the code generating process, but, uh, you know, I can't really, it doesn't look like people are directly copying, so that's good. But, uh, you know, uh, 
it should be your own work with the code. And I know uh, we've talked about that, about how much exactly you can help people. But again, the idea is basically you can explain the concepts all you want. And, um, you know, if somebody's really struggling and, and is describing their approach, maybe you can tell them, you know, what is not not the way to go, maybe. But, you know, I don't want you actually seeing each other's code and sharing it. Um, and certainly don't use each other's code if you happen to accidentally glimpse it or whatever. Um, but I think generally what this means is that you guys are kind of getting like uh, how to play around with the code and get something working if there's not too much, um, not too much that you have to like really understand in a deep way. But, um, but you're still not totally sure about how this stuff works like through and through. So, um, so we're going to try to emphasize, I think, in these last few lectures this semester and all of next semester, a little bit more of a deeper understanding. And again, um, you know, it's sort of a limitation how much we can get into this stuff given the amount of time that we have. And I did want to get into the interesting stuff early this semester, which entailed kind of dropping some big ideas on you, like functions and all these PsychoPy modules and stuff, before we'd really done a lot of fundamentals. Um, but I think now that we've sort of talked, shown you the kinds of things you can do with PsychoPy, it's time to really back up and make sure we get the fundamentals. So I think um, problem set five is going to focus a lot more on that kind of thing. Um, so I think what, what I've learned from problem set four is that you guys, uh, we need to practice a little bit more on like coming up with an idea from scratch and using using the concepts we've talked about in ways that you haven't used them before and like coming up with your own algorithms for doing things um, and really kind of uh, more deeply understanding how these concepts work. So I think uh, maybe we jumped a little too fast in problem set four into uh, doing that straight away. So I think in problem set five, I'm going to ask you some more questions on explaining, or actually I don't think I've asked you this before, more questions that every time you write code, I will then ask you to explain what your code does. Um, because in programming, there's like a certain amount of just messing around and trying to get something to work and flailing randomly until you get the right solution. But that shouldn't be the only way that you do this. Uh, you shouldn't do it the like monkeys with a typewriter way most of the time. So, you know, even if you're like not totally sure how something works and you kind of take a guess and it works, you should still then look it up what, what you did and figure out why what you did works, not just go, oh, well, it works and that's good. Uh, next problem, okay? so. I think what I'm going to start doing is asking you guys to explain your code once you've written it so that you actually know why your solution works. Um, I'm going to give you, I think, some questions where I don't, I think one of the problems with problem set four is I was asking you to both write the code and figure out what the code should be doing at the same time, which is what you're doing when you're programming. But like, I know it's probably hard for you guys to go straight into like coming up with an algorithm for something like printing out that pyramid of triangular numbers. You know, like, maybe it would have been easier if I told you the basic steps and then you wrote the code for it, or vice versa. So I think I'm going to include a few questions where I give you the algorithm for something in English, and you just have to write the code corresponding to it. Um, and I will probably also give you a question or two where I write some code that works, and you just have to explain in English what it does to make sure that you really understand what each part of the the line is doing. Um, and then I may ask you to do the other part of programming, which is to, without writing any code, think of the way you would do something as an algorithm, like what a good way is for calculating um, triangular numbers in words. Um, so, I mean, I don't think it's giving too much away for problem set four to say, you know, a good way to calculate a triangular set of triangular numbers is to start with one, uh, then add two, then whatever the result of that is, add three, save that result. Whatever the result of that is, add four, save that result, you know, and so on, right? So that's the kind of thing I might be asking you to describe in English um, in problem set five. Uh, so hopefully that will help out a bit. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of take a little bit of a step back in problem set five, I think, um, and then maybe problem set six will ramp up again to about where problem set four was uh, in terms of how much I'm expecting you to generate on your own. Um, but uh, that's the update on the problem sets. Now, how are people, I know people found this one difficult, and the deadline is currently set to tomorrow. Are people still finding it really difficult? Or, okay. So, uh, 
let me give you, I did download the problem set, so let me give you a few hints maybe um, to talk, talk through this. Are people mostly still hung up on question one? I know a lot of people were hung up. Uh, so what I've been told is that question three is not too difficult if you understand questions one and two. And really question two, I'm told, is not as difficult, but I think a lot of people are just stuck on the basics of question one. Is that, is that kind of right? All right. And question two, okay, yeah. Um, so for question one, I, for, so a lot of people have come and I've given them kind of similar hints. So um, maybe I will give you all the sort of official hints for question one, uh, at least for part A. Um, because I think really the issue that uh, people are having is uh, I think it's not quite clicking. And again, this is partly my fault for how I explained it, um, if not entirely my fault. But um, I think because you're having trouble with question one and even part A of question one, I think that means it's not quite clicking to you exactly how these tuples work. Um, so, you know, people are having trouble seeing what happens when we call uh, play my tuple and what you should do to make play my tuple work, right? So um, the thing that you kind of have to do in your programming is try to think like the computer, try to be the computer and think about what information is going where at every step of the process, right? So don't try to tackle the problem all at once, but just try to think about what each line does, break it down and, and think about what's going to happen when you execute each line, right? So when you create, when you use a line of code like my tuple equals that, and I'll go ahead and just paste this into the shell to show you. Um, so you create a variable called my tuple, right, inside of the script, which contains, uh, the analogy I used with some of you guys is that it's like a bag, right? So the tuple is like a bag. It acts like one thing, but it's got other things inside, right? It's got a C as its first thing, a 4 as its second thing, and a 0.5 as its third thing. So now the name my tuple is like the name stamped on this bag of information, right? But this exists only within this script, within the PSO4 question1.py file. So then when you call the function play my tuple, what, does, what happens when you, when you uh, use this function play my tuple? And you give it my tuple. All right, well, we want, we're giving... We're giving the information, or we're giving this bag called my tuple to this function called play my tuple, right? Now, what do we use to refer to this information now that we're in the function play my tuple? Or to put it another way, what information do you have to work with when you start out? The, the very first line of play my tuple, what information does play my tuple have to work with to do its job? Well, how many arguments does it have? One, right? And a function, so as we talked about before, a function really only, kn I mean, you know as the person writing the function what it's supposed to do, but inside the world of the function, the function only has whatever information you give it. And so we're giving it what was called my tuple. We're giving it a bag that was labeled my tuple inside of our script, but what is that bag now labeled as far as play my tuple is concerned? What, so what is your code within play my tuple right in here? What does that refer to that bag as? Okay, it calls it this tuple, right? So that's a, a fundamental distinction. I think people maybe still weren't getting from um, uh, from from before about functions is so you, you think of functions as maybe I mean we've used lots of analogies, but think of a function as like someone passing you something through like you know, through a hole in the wall where you can't see them. You, you have the information that's coming in, but you don't know what they were calling it. So you call it by your own name, right? So when we get this tuple, all we know, all the information we have to work with in Play My Tuple is whatever's inside this tuple, right? Uh, so we don't know that it was called My Tuple back here, right? We only know that we are calling it this tuple inside of the Play My Tuple function. And... Um, we don't know anything about any of the other variables that are defined in problem set four, question one, right? So we don't know that eventually it's going to create a variable called notes and so forth. 
we only know that we have this information called this tuple, right? Now, if you want to see what's in this tuple, you could do something like print it out, right? You could define the function as not something that plays a note, but something that prints out a note. And I'm just going to comment out all the other parts that relate to parts B and C, because we don't care about running those right at the moment. OK, so if we run this and look at the output, oops, what did I do wrongly? Oh, wait, I, sorry, I ran the wrong file, didn't I? All right, yes. So a bunch of function definitions doesn't do anything when you run it, but uh, this does. OK, so what this does is it prints out the contents of all the tuples that go into play my tuple, right? It's all the same tuples that we define in this file. So basically what we know is that this tuple, right, is going to contain, you can think of it as being like a copy of my tuple. Uh, it's not totally accurate, but you can think of it as that, that way. So this tuple is another name for the same bag that we called my tuple back in this file. So this tuple is now a tuple. We know it's a bag with three pieces of information in it. And, and we know, you know, in our brains, the function doesn't know this, but we know in our brains that this bag will always contain a first element that is a note name, a second element that's an octave, and a third element that is um, a duration for that note, right? Okay. So we know those are the same three pieces of information we need to play a note. Um, the only question is how we split them apart, okay? Now one thing I don't think a lot of people realized, um, and maybe I wasn't clear enough about this, is that what I suggested to you in the problem set is that you should use the function defined earlier in this file, play me a note. Oops, play me a note. And to actually do the playing of the note, right? So play me a note um, takes three things, right? A note name, an octave, and a duration. So you're going to want to do something like this. Well, let's call it something else just for fun. Uh, the note, the oct, the duration, or whatever. So you're going to want to have a line like that inside this play my tuple function, which does all the heavy lifting of creating a psychopi sound object, calling the play function, or the play method, and, uh, and waiting for a certain amount of time for the note to be over before it does anything else. Okay, so maybe I just wasn't clear before that functions can call other functions, right? And actually that's sort of what you're doing, like you're doing things like that here, right? So psychopi.core.wait is a function defined somewhere else. So functions can call other functions. You don't have to copy and paste this code, you can just use the play me a note function in your play my tuple function, right? And similarly, when you get down to like the play tuple list function, I highly recommend that you, once you get play my tuple working, that you use the play my tuple function inside the play tuple list function, okay? That you don't just copy and paste code, you actually include somewhere in this code, you know, whatever you're doing, so something, 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 and then play my tuple, and you know, and put some tuple there, right? So I think that was one thing that wasn't clear to people is that you can actually use these previously defined functions. So then the only question is, how do you take this bag of information with these three things in it and separate it out into the three separate things that play me a note wants, right? Because play me a note is expecting three things. Um, what, what you have is a bag containing those three things, but Play me a note doesn't know that. Play me a note, if you give it just one thing, it's like, well, I need three things to play a note, right? So what you really need to do in play my tuple is take those three things out of the bag, give them their own name, and, uh, and then give them to play me a note, right? Now, again, we went over this last class, but maybe it was too quick. The thing that you use to take, uh, get the pieces of a tuple is this square bracket operator, right? So, so we said my tuple is this, right? It's C4, 0 0.5. So if you want to know the first thing in my tuple, you put my tuple, square bracket, and what? Okay, I think I heard it, zero, right? Because in, again, in Python, we start counting with zero, not with one. So to get the first thing, it's really the zero thing. So my tuple zero is the C, my tuple one is the four, and my tuple two 
is the 0 0.5, right? So those are the three pieces of information that are inside that bag, right? And that's how you refer to them as separate things, right? And maybe, so, so that's about all I can, I mean, I think I've, I think when I say that, I've kind of given away the answer, but maybe it's still not totally clicking uh, for some people because of the way I've explained it previously. So the only other thing to mention is that, remember, just like in arithmetic um, or an algebra class, um, different ways of saying the same thing are basically interchangeable in Python, right? So a way to say this is if you think of the number 15, it's the number 15, right? If you think of the expression 5 times 3, in parentheses or, or round brackets, it's 15, right? And we know from mathematics that you can substitute um, any two things that have the same value, you can substitute, right? So um, in other words, if we use the play me a note function, um, you know, and, it, and well, this won't work because I haven't imported it yet, but if you were to say something like play me a uh, note, you know, C for 0 0.5. Okay, so that's not going to work, but just pretend it worked, right? So that's the kind of code you wrote before in problem set 3. It would also work equally well if you defined a variable called A as the note C, a variable called B as the number 4, a variable called C as 0 0.5. And then if you did play me uh, note A, B, C, that would be exactly the same thing, okay? So there's nothing... There's nothing really special about variables. Uh, they're just names for information, right? So whether the, like, in other words, whether, whether if we set A equal to 15, A is the same thing as the number 15 is the same thing as the expression 5 times 3, right? So uh, does that, is that making sense to me? I'm trying to think of a good way to explain that. So whatever name you call the information by, the important thing is the information that goes into something, right? So, so play me a note is expecting three pieces of information, a note name, an octave, and a duration. Now, it expects these to come in certain forms, right? It expects the note name to be like a letter of the alphabet. It expects the octave to be a, an integer, right, from like one to eight, because there are eight octaves that we can reasonably hear. I think it's eight. Um, and a duration which is some decimal amount of time, and we've mostly been using like half a second, one whole second, things like that, right? But it doesn't really care. When you, when you use play me a note, you can pass in what we call literals, which is just the written information, like C in quotes and 4 and 0.5. You can pass it variables, anything like that. And you can even pass it expressions that... Um, that uh, that evaluates something. So, well, let's let's just quickly. All right, let's write some quick. Let's write some quick demo code to show you this. Okay, so let's do this. Um, so I just want this is an important concept. So it's worth talking about, even though uh, you know it's not exactly what we had on the docket for today, but I think it's worth mentioning. So we'll comment out all the tuple stuff. We're just going to use play me a note, which we have established actually works, right? So if you have play me a uh, note C for 0.5, save that. Okay, so that works, right? Now if we do A equals C, B equals 4, C equals 0.5, we do play a uh, note, A, B, C. It should sound identical, right? Okay, so that's true. Now, think about this. We could also do something like this. Play me a uh, note. And I, I actually did this implicitly uh, a couple times, and I think some of you did it in your problem sets, but I just want to drive this home. Uh, you can do things like play me a note C 2 times 2. 1.0 divided by 2, right? 2 times 2 is 4. 1.0 divided by 2 is 0 0.5. Okay, so that works the same way, right? And you can even do things like uh, if we import our, oops, we import our random module, 
Oops. So we could even do something like embed another function call inside of this play me note. So we could say play me uh, note. See, let's pick a random, a random uh, octave from two through six. Okay, so we could do random dot rand int. I think that. Let's see. I think that's the right way to do it, right? Random dot rand int. Okay, that should work. So we could do something like this, right? Where we have, oops, sorry, what else do I need in here? Yeah, the duration, I forgot to put in a duration. So let's just make it half second to be easy. So now what we should get is two, uh, or three identical C notes, and then a C note at a random octave. Ooh, that was weird. Okay. Apparently it didn't generate one of the octaves very well. It's either too low or too high. Okay, same one again. Okay, so that was a random four apparently. Oh, that was very low. I don't know if you guys could hear it. Anyway, so does that make sense to anyone? So to everyone? So basically what happens is when you include, think about it like, uh, Computer programs, just like mathematical expressions, and maybe I never explicitly said this, but they follow a kind of order of operations, right? So when the computer reads this line of code, this line 10 here, what it says is, all right, you've called some function called play me a note. So first it has to make sure that there is a function called play me a note, and it looks through everything that you've imported, and it's like, oh, okay, there's a play me a note function in one of the files you imported. So I know what to do when I get to that function. And it says, all right, they're trying to give play me a note three pieces of information, a C, a 0 0.5. Oh, and this other thing here is also a function call. So before I can give this information to play me a note, I actually need to first evaluate this function call, right? So it's just like order of operations, like where you do the innermost uh, parentheses or brackets first. It has to actually evaluate what this random.randent is before it gives that information to play me a note, right? So another way of saying this is that this code is totally equivalent to just doing this. My random octave equals that and giving it my random octave. Right, so this will work exactly the same way. Right? Okay. So it doesn't matter, to the, to the computer it doesn't really matter whether you assign a name to this random number and then give play me a note the name, or whether you just put this random.randent uh, function call inside here directly, right? The only thing that matters is that play me a note gets this information in the end. So if you give it, in other words, if you express an, a piece of information as what we call a literal, which is just the number or the string itself, then the computer doesn't have to do anything else to pass that information to the function. If you give it a variable name, all it has to do is look up what information that variable represents and give that information to the other function. If you give it a function call, it first has to evaluate that function and then give the result to uh, the play me a note function. Does that kind of make sense to people? Does that Hopefully, maybe that confuses things more, but maybe it makes things make more sense. So all of that is to say there are multiple ways that you could express. If you're trying to write the play my tuple function, there are multiple ways you could express what goes into the note, the oct, and the dir. Uh, I mean, you don't have to make variables name this necessarily. So you could, there is a way to do this, that this function only has one line besides the def line. Uh, and you just have to figure out exactly what expressions to put in here that cause the note to be played, right? Or you could, there's another common way to do it that would probably involve three other lines of code. And while explaining it to, I think, Becky, uh, or while talking about this to Becky, we also came upon another way that I didn't actually teach you about that you could do it that involves two lines, involves two lines of code, but I don't expect you to come up on that variant of it. So it's probably either going to be just one line of code or four lines of code in addition to the definition line. Um, 
And again, my recommendation to you is that you make sure you understand how that, what we call the uh, slicing or the indexing, the um, using the brackets to indicate my tuple zero versus my tuple one versus my tuple two, okay? Does that, hopefully everyone's kind of, that's making sense to people a little bit more with, with lists and tuples and things. And, and lists will work exactly the same way. Um, and, and, oh, so the other thing I will mention that I, multiple people have asked about is, and this is the last hint I will give on this uh, problem, is that if you have something like this tuple equals or anything with this tuple on the left side of the equal sign, um, that means your, your thinking is not right on this solution, right? Because there, there are two issues with this, and I, I've told you some of you this already. One of which is one factor about tuples is they can't be changed, okay? So, um, so you can certainly like, so it's sort of like a magical bag now, I guess, uh, where basically the magic of the bag is once the bag is created with these items inside it, you can't put additional items inside, you can't um, change the order of the items inside, you can't, uh, you can't swap out the item inside for something else, you can't change the items that are inside this tuple. So this means, um, well, so what you really can't do is something like this, okay? So you could always say this tuple, like I could say down here where I have my tuple defined, right? That's actually, that's okay to do because what I actually did here is I just changed the name my tuple. Instead of referring to a tuple, now it refers to a string. But if we define a tuple the way that we did earlier, like C four zero, oops, 0 0.5, right? So we have my tuple. We can look at what my tuple zero is and it's C. But what we can't do is we can't say my tuple zero equals D, right? So that's an error because you can't change the items inside a bag, okay? So if you gave the bag a name, you can say, you know what, I don't like that. I don't like that that name refers to a tuple anymore. I can use that name to refer to something else. You can do that, but you can't actually change what's in that bag once that magical bag of items is created, okay? Now you can change a list. You can add to a list. You can move, you can replace items in a list. You can do all kinds of stuff to items in a list, but a tuple you can't change. So you definitely can't do something like this. The other reason this is not the right way to go, so if you have this tuple on the left-hand side of an equal sign, uh, you're in trouble because play my tuple, the function, does not know about any other information in the world. Like, it doesn't have any other information given to it except what's in this tuple. So if you're trying to change part of this tuple to something else, you don't know what else to change it to. Does that make sense? Like, the tuple is all the information that you have. Um, so you don't necessarily want this tuple anywhere on the left side of an equal sign because um, A, you're not allowed to change the information, and B, you don't have any other information to work with. You only have these three pieces of information that are already in the tuple, okay? Now, whether you want to assign something else to be equal to a part of the tuple, maybe, maybe that's something you might want to do, but you don't want to try to change one of the tuple items you might instead try to uh, assign a name to one of the tuple items, right? So one thing we can do is say, like, first part of tuple equals my tuple zero. That's totally okay, right? And then first part of tuple refers to C, okay? So that's just saying, well, we know that my tuple is equal to my tuple zero, is equal to the string C. So this is the same exact thing as saying first part of tuple equals C, okay? That's just giving a name to a string, and that's totally okay. So you can do that, you just can't do the inverted version of this line where my tuple zero is on the left, right? So, all right, is everybody kind of clear on that, or at least when you watch this again later tonight or tomorrow on the podcast, you'll be clear on it, hopefully? Uh, okay, I think I've basically pretty much given away the answer to 1A at this point. If, if you're still not quite getting it, hopefully you can talk it over with friends or come to me and maybe I can explain it a little bit better. But that should be definitely all the information you need for 1A. Hopefully then 1B and 1C will become a lot easier and so will the rest of the problem set. So I won't go over the rest of that. Um, the only thing I will mention is um, 
you know, for for parts B and C, if you haven't figured this out already, um, you will probably want to use some kind of loop, okay? So I'll tell you that much, that parts B and C should probably involve loops. Um, whereas part A does not have to involve any sort of loop, although it, in theory, actually could. Uh, okay, so that's enough about problem set four. Now, my last question to you is, having been given this information, do you guys want to one more day to work on problem set four? Have it due Thursday instead of Wednesday? Or would you rather just have it out of your life as of tomorrow? Shall we put it to a vote for the people doing it for credit? So who wants it just out of their lives tomorrow and keep the Wednesday due date? All right, who wants the extension till Thursday? All right, so more people, all right, so you can have the extension, that's fine. Um, okay, and if, again, if people are having, like if you're totally, totally stuck, I realize that, um, you know, parts of this problem set build on other parts and I didn't expect it to be quite this hard to get the first couple of parts. Um, so if you're just still totally stuck, please come to me tomorrow or Thursday or later today. I'll explain more. Um, again, you know, if you don't do perfectly on these problem sets, that's okay. Uh, you know, again, what the pass is what, 70 here or 70? I mean, an A is like 70% here, right? So, uh, or is it 75? I forget what it is. I always have to look it up again whenever we do marking. But anyway, you know, three quarters is still doing very, very well, right? So you don't have to get everything. And I will always give you partial credit for your logic or like, say if you couldn't get part A working at all for some reason, but you totally knew how you would do part B and part C if part A worked, I would still give you full credit for part B and part C, even if they depended on a non-working version of part A, okay? So, you know, some stuff you can kind of get an idea of, or at least you can describe in words what you think you should do, uh, even if you can't get the final answer. That said, I don't want you totally beating yourself up, you know, because you can't get the first few parts done. So um, I'll try to help you with that. All right, that's like way longer than I wanted to spend on that problem set, but hopefully that helps you guys. We'll make it due um, Thursday, and I'll probably have the next problem set out later Thursday or Friday, but that one won't be due till like the following Monday or so. So that still gives you like 10 days or so either way. Okay, any other questions on this, these tuples and problem sets and stuff like that? Or any other things that people were not clear about from problem set four? Okay, I hope, hopefully I've given you enough hints there. All right, so let's go on. Um, change, well, all right, I'll talk about a couple other things real quick. I know this is like a lot of talking. Um, the other couple of things I just wanted to mention is, um, you know, what we're trying to do here now for the next, a uh, few weeks and for the rest of the course is to deepen your understanding of how these things work, okay? So that's one, hopefully I just sort of, some things clicked for you when I was explaining those things about tuples. And that's ultimately the sort of understanding that uh, we want to go for in this class, right? Because what you're probably finding out doing problem set four is that even if things like made sense to you in lecture before and you did well on the problem sets before where you're mostly like changing small bits of code or fixing code that doesn't work, or problems where you can like play around with a few lines of code uh, and get them to work, or places where you can like cut and paste things from a bunch of different places and kind of slightly tweak it to get it working. That's a lot different from when you have to come up with something totally just from, from a description of a problem, right? So that's gonna depend on this sort of deeper level of understanding. It's not just sort of kind of getting what a, a line of code does, but really understanding like all the implications of a line of code. So uh, so my notes here are to talk about things like good versus, so there, there are different types of explanations you can give to things, right? And what I'm hoping for is that your explanations about these things will get better and better as time goes on. So if I ask you a question like, why do things fall when we drop them? Uh, you know, I have been getting answers that are kind of equivalent to like the answer because of gravity. And that is technically true, but it's not a very, it doesn't explain how the thing works, right? So what I'm really looking for when I ask you to explain stuff is to give the deepest explanation that you can give within, you know, a reasonable amount of space, right? So if I really, if I asked you why things fall when we drop them, I would say, well, there's a fundamental force in the universe called gravity. What it means is that any two bodies with mass um, are attracted to each other and that that depends on how far apart they are. But basically, because the Earth is very big, and because the thing that you're dropping is generally very small, um, 
what it will look like is that the thing that you're dropping gets pulled towards the Earth and not the other way around because the size of the uh, object makes a difference as to how hard it pulls on the other object, right? Or something like that. That shows me that you actually understand what, like, how gravity works and not just that there's a thing called gravity. The name of something is not an explanation for it, right? So, um, like in the previous problem set, problem set three, uh, to give a, an example or two, um, what was the question? And this is not like, this is not picking on anyone in particular because a lot of people give these kinds of answers. Um, let's see. Okay, so a lot, now not everyone, I got, I got a few pretty good answers for this one, but most people gave what I would consider like a not deep enough explanation for part F. Like if you remember the code was this thing that displayed like seven circles in a row at a certain vertical position on the screen, right? And it said, explain briefly and to the best of your ability why the circles get displayed in the positions they do. And a lot of people said something like, well, because of the variables x coordinate and y coordinate or something like that. Um, which is sort of true, but it doesn't tell me that you understood exactly what was going on in the code. What was going on in the code was we set the y coordinate to be one single value at the beginning of the script. I think it was minus 70. And it never changed thereafter, right? So that's why all the circles got displayed at the same uh, vertical location. And the reason they got displayed at different horizontal locations is because we used a for loop that looped through several numbers, and each time the x coordinate was recalculated to be some multiple of that number that we were looping through. So it went from negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. So the x coordinates became negative 180, negative 120, negative 60, zero, 60, 120, 180. And so that's why all the circles had different x coordinates, but they all have the same y coordinates. Okay, so that would have been like the sort of complete answer that I would be, and it doesn't have to be said exactly like this or that complete, but that's more of the kind of answer uh, we would be looking for, right? Uh, and again, the, the, thing, the thing to note, uh, and my other example is like how a car works. The thing to note is that you can become, there's no, it's turtles all the way down, if you guys have ever heard that, uh, that anecdote. You could go on forever explaining these things. If I, if I ask you how a car works, probably the worst answer is you turn the key and move the wheel and the pedals and it goes, right? That tells you a little bit about how to drive a car, but it doesn't tell you how the car works. A slightly better way would be to say, well, there's this thing called a combustion engine, and you put gasoline in and you mix it with air, and then a little spark ignites the gasoline and makes it explode, and the explosions move these pistons that eventually go through a bunch of gears and stuff and cause your wheels to turn, right? That would be a better explanation of how a car works. Now, the thing that you don't want to do is get buried in details and say, well, here's how the equation governing the combustion of gasoline works, and this happens because the molecules are in a certain configuration. And this happens because, you know, those molecules have these atoms in them. And this occurs because of quantum theory, which we don't really understand, right? Uh, you don't need to go to that level of detail. But what we would, you know, if I ask you how a car works, I would like to know more than just you turn the key and rotate the wheel and push the pedals. I want to know a little bit about what's under the hood, so to speak, or under the, what is it, bonnet in British English? So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be incredibly detailed, but I'm hoping to to get explanations that show that you guys know not only like what the thing is called and maybe like what, you know, what syntax to use or what, you know, uh, what things to type in Python, but what things actually do. Okay. Uh, or, or how they work or like, you know, that you could take it apart and put it back together again and that you sort of know what you're doing. All right. So everybody cool? Any other questions on the problem sets or anything like that? Okay, so hopefully that was that impromptu uh, lesson on tuples firms up everybody's tuple uh, knowledge a little bit and helps out for the problem set. Okay, so let's do let's do a few minutes of the first demo here and see how far we get, um, because I want to sort of start building in the demos tasks that are a little bit more like real tasks you might do. Um, so let's pull up our code from last time, and what I would recommend. Uh, Oh, second by, what are you doing? Um, so what I'd recommend this time, so we're going to do a lot of demo stuff today. So I, I will say it is up to you whether you want to type in the code and follow along or whether you would rather just watch and understand. Um, 
because either one is fine, and I'll, I'll do what I did the last couple of lectures and um, make these available to you. So when I, whatever I finish today. So it's sort of up to you. And actually, probably a couple of the um, functions I'm relying on, I'm going to make you write in your next problem set. Oops. Uh, so this is what we had last time. If you want to follow along and make the modifications I make, this stuff is all in the um, class folder. OK, so if you remember last time, we had just sort of done a tuple example where we wrote the script that says, we're going to play some pairs of tones. Your task is to tell me if they're the same or different pitch. You press S if they're the same, D if they're different. Do your best, here we go. And that's as far as we got. So what I'm quickly going to try to do here is just finish up this task. And then uh, you'll kind of see how these things start to fit together. And then what we'll hopefully get to by the end of class is, um, is incorporating the concepts about timing that we're talking about today. But we may run a little bit into next class as well. OK, so what we've done so far in the, in the code is we've presented the instructions, right? Hopefully, everybody gets what's going on here. So, so far, all we've done is we've imported some things. And again, you might, if you don't get the difference between import and from import, it's not really worth explaining in class, but I think it would be a useful thing to look up on your own. It's a pretty simple explanation. Uh, we've created some variables to name certain things like our screen resolution, how many trials we want to run, maybe the minimum and maximum hertz of the sounds that we're going to use. We've defined some strings for the text of the instructions. We've also put those into a tuple so that to present them, we can just present them in a couple lines of code here uh, using this prompt key press function that we've written before. And now we're done presenting instructions and we're ready to do the task, right? Okay. So, um, so let's do a couple things here. So let's add a little my window dot flip here. And we're going to get a little bit more into what this actually does uh, either today or next time. But keep in mind that what my window does or what my window dot flip does is it flips around whatever you've been drawing on the hidden screen and it shows it to the user, right? So uh, if you haven't done anything, you have nothing written, you have like a clear board on your, on your hidden screen, right? So what this is going to do at this stage in the program is just is clear out the screen, right? So whenever you want to clear the screen in PsychoPy, all you have to do is call, you know, your window dot flip and not have anything drawn on it and it will show a blank screen, right? All right, so we blanked our screen. Now what we're going to do is uh, present a series of trials. We've said right now that we want to do five trials to the user. So what are we going to use to uh, present five trials to the user? What is our uh, structural element going to be here? Or what is our, what's the next word I'm going to type in the script? All right, it's going to be four, right? Because we want to do th something five times, it makes sense to do a, a loop, a for loop that goes from, well, one to five or zero to four or something like that. So what we'll do is we'll say for trial num in x range. And we have a, we don't want to say x range five, right? We want to say x range in trials, right? Because the, the reason we define the name in trials um, is so that we could just change it up here and then it will automatically, you know, affect the behavior of the script, right? I noticed, again, some things in problem set three where people reuse numbers that had already been defined as variables. So you don't want to do that, right? You want to use the name uh, whenever you can because then you can just make one change up here and then that name will refer to that number every time thereafter that you use it. So this is maybe not seeming like a big deal to you guys right now, but if you ever write a large piece of software, the worst thing in the world is to say, oh, well, I know it's always going to be five things. I'll just put in the number five because I'm lazy. And you use it like a hundred times throughout your script. And then somebody says, you know, I think we should actually do this with six. And then you have to find every time the number five appears in your script, but not the times when it appears in like the number 15 for something else or the number 50 for something else. You know, it's a real pain to go searching through your code if you use a number multiple times. Um, for the literal number, which is why we give names to even things that we don't expect to change, right? So we don't expect the number of trials to change, but we might need to refer to the number of trials more than once in our script. So it's better to refer to the name than the, the literal number. Okay, all right, everybody cool so far? So the next thing we're gonna wanna do, uh, so, so this task that we're gonna do, this kind of dumb psychophysics task, 
is going to generate two tones that are either the same or different. Um, if they're different, it's going to randomly pick the frequency of the tones. This is not a very good task, again, but it'll do for a start. Um, and then it's going to play them to the user. So th what's, what's one of the first things we have to decide before we do anything in this trial? Let's assume we're picking everything randomly, that we're not going off a stimulus list or anything like that. So what do we, and let's say there's a 50-50 chance that they'll be the same or different. So what's one of the first things we have to decide to do in each trial? Well, in any cognitive task um, that has multiple types of conditions, one of the first things you need to do is figure out which condition it's going to be, right? So we need to think about whether it's, um, whether we're going to do a same frequency trial or a different frequency trial, right? Um, so the question to you now is, how might I do that? So if I want to, basically I'm going to flip a coin, right? I want to flip a coin that says uh, there's a 50% chance I present two, two of the same tone and a 50% chance I choose two different tones. Um, how would I do that? What's, what's one way I can, one way using what you guys know already, one way that I can uh, pick something randomly with a 50% probability. Okay, right, so we know we have various functions for random numbers, right? Now we don't have, if we import, have we imported random yet? No, we haven't, so let's import random. So just think about this, if we import random, we have numbers like random.random, .random, or sorry, functions like random.random .random or random.rand int, right? But we don't have something like random, if you look at the various options, we don't have anything like random dot coin flip or something like that, right? We don't have a, something that gives us a random true false. But what we can do is use something like random dot rand int. So if we say random dot rand int, uh, if we want a random integer between one and two, well that's either going to be one or two. So depending on whether it gives us one or whether it gives us two, that gives us basically a coin flip. Does that make sense to everybody? So another completely equivalent way to do this would be to say, random dot random, which gives us a random decimal value between 0 and 1, and then say, well, is that above or below 0 0.5, right? Same basic idea. So whenever you need to do something randomly, you can think about things like um, how you might transform one of these two forms of random numbers into the random value that you need. Small hint, this might be on the problem set um, in a slightly different form. Okay, so we could do something like if random dot rand int one two is equal to one so and again it doesn't really matter what one is or two is let's say that one means let's say one equals same tone twice all right so let's to not confuse us with equal sign all right so if we do that um, what we're going to need to do now is um, uh, let's call this like frequency one. Uh, we're going to need to pick a random value in hertz. Okay, so uh, let's see how I did this here. Well, actually, to save a little bit of time, let's just do it a slightly simpler way than what I was going to do. So if I want to change, if I want to pick a random value. And I've already set the minimum frequency and the maximum frequency up here to 200 and 2,000. How do I select a random frequency between 200 and 2,000? What can I use? All right, I'll give you a hint. I used it on line 22, just one line previously. Okay, so we're going to use random.randint again. Right, which will give us a random number. Now, how do we tell it to go between our minimum and maximum possible values? Okay, so we, we could write 200, 2,000, right? But a better way to do it would be to say, use the names for these things, right? Minimum hertz and maximum hertz, right? Because maybe someday we want to run this task on dogs, and dogs can hear much higher frequencies than we can, 
And then if we want to run the task on dogs that can operate levers somehow and keyboards, uh, you know, we can then just change this to like 200,000 hertz or whatever, and uh, it'll work just the same for the dog, but with higher frequencies. Okay, so we can pick a random frequency, and then uh, there's various ways we can do this, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a variable for the second sound that they hear on each trial. And I'm just going to set this equal to frequency 1, because if they're the same, then they should be the same, right? Uh, now, there are various other ways I could do this, but this will get it done in the fewest lines of code. Okay, so now we've got to do the other option, which is if random.randent up here gave us 2, then our sort of otherwise option, or else option, is going to be pick two different columns. Okay, um, so if we want to pick two different tones, what do we do here for frequency one? We want to pick two tones, both randomly. What can we write here for line 26? All right, so same as 23, right? So we just, again, want to pick a random frequency. Now, I'm going to be super lazy. This is not good practice, but we're not going to use this example very many times. Uh, and just do the same exact thing for picking the second frequency here, okay? Now, all right, so here's my question. Why is this being lazier? What am, I, what am I not doing that I probably should if I wanted to make a perfect version of this task? So this will successfully pick two random frequencies to play. What is the possible small issue with this code right here? Okay, there's a, there's a very small chance that I might, by random chance, pick the same two frequencies, right? And the problem is, I'm going to think it's a different trial, but it's actually a same trial. Oh, so that, that brings in another smart thing. So what's one more thing I need to do in, in these if and else statements is I need to create some kind of variable that tells me whether this trial is a same or different trial, right? Because otherwise I have no way of telling whether the person is correct. So let's make a variable called correct answer. And we'll say that if it's same, the correct answer is S. And if it's a different trial, the correct answer is D, right? Okay, so this is, this is the potential issue, which is that there is a, what are there? There's a 1,801 integers between 200 and 2,000. So there's a 1 over 1,801 chance. So in, in every 1,801 trials, roughly speaking, there's going to be a trial where we present the exact same frequency to someone. Uh, they say it's the same, and the code says, no, it's different, right? But we're just going to accept that level of error for the, uh, for the demo we're doing right now. Okay, so now we've picked our information that defines what's going on in the trial. So now um, let's actually run our trial, okay? So what I'm going to do here is to make, make our code a little bit cleaner, I'm going to rely on a function. Uh, I'm going to write a function that presents these two sounds. Um, and have I already written this in here? No, I have not. But what I'm going to do, because I'm going to speed things along, is I'm going to just copy this function out of the next version. All right, so I've got this function here called present sounds. So let's, oh, look, I'm really good at writing functions really fast. So I'm going to write a function right here, and it's called present sounds, and uh, now we're done. Okay. Uh, so now I'm doing some cheating here too, but what this function will do is it'll take two frequencies passed into it. It Again, this is sort of lazy programming. This is not really what you should do, but it, it sort of assumes that the sounds are always going to be half a second long. Um, it's going to create cycle by sound objects for each frequency. Then it's going to play the first one, wait twice that sound duration to give a little break in between the frequencies, uh, play the second sound, and then wait twice that duration before it does anything else. Okay, now that's a good example of a function that is defined. It's not defined to really save us typing because we only use it once in our script. But one thing it'll do is make our code a bit cleaner to like say, all right, well, 
we present the sounds here. We don't really need to worry about the details of how they're presented within our main script here. So it's sometimes nice to like sort of outsource um, chunks of code to functions just to make your code a little bit cleaner because otherwise you're going to have a really long file. Uh, oops, what did I also do here? I had a typo. Okay, so now we've played our sounds. And again, this is just giving the basic structure of this task into place so that we can make some modifications later today. Um, so now what we're going to do is um, try to get an answer. And again, I'm going to be a little bit lazy here like we have been before, and we'll, get, we'll be less lazy on the second revision. So we'll say um, answer equals, if you remember, we already wrote a function called prompt key press that you guys have used a bunch of times. And we'll say, uh, we'll prompt for the key press Oh, you know what? We've already got um, we've already got the probe text defined, right? Same or different S or, S or D. So we just say probe text, right? And again, that's kind of nice that we don't have to be writing like long strings inside of our function or inside of our for loop, rather. Sorry. Um, so now what we've got is we've got an answer and. Um, what we can say then is check and see if the person's right or wrong. And we can say if answer equals correct answer. Um, oops, what did I forget there? Okay, thank you. Syntax police are always good to watch out uh, for. All right, so we could do something like say, well, then we're going to tell them this. If the answer is correct, we'll say correct. Uh, press any key to continue. And otherwise, oops, uh, let's say our feedback text will be sorry, wrong answer, press any key to continue. All right, something like that. Now we have to actually show that feedback text now, right? So we can prompt a key press where we don't actually care what the output is, right? So uh, oops, uh, what are, uh, not probe text, uh, feedback text, right? Now, everybody see what I did there? Now hopefully you're familiar with prompt key press by now because we've used it a bunch of times. So here we use prompt key press if you remember what prompt key press does, it, wait, it puts some text up on the screen, it waits for a key to be pressed, and it returns the first key pressed. Now, what we're doing here is we don't care what key is pressed, right? So we, we are discarding the option to save what key was pressed, right? We're, we're ignoring the option to save whatever key was pressed. So, again, it, I'm not sure if this is already clear to people or, or if you're still a little fuzzy on functions, but just because a function returns a value doesn't mean you have to use it, okay? So it's your option whether or not you save the value that a function returns. So prompt key press down here will tell us what key you hit to continue, but we don't care. We just care that it waits for the key press before it goes on. Okay, so that's all well and good. And then uh, actually, you know what I'm going to do here just to save line of code? I'm going to actually move this myWindow.flip to the beginning of this loop because then it'll run every loop and I don't have to clear the screen at the end of the loop. It'll just re-clear at the beginning of the loop. Um, and then we're going to end with like an ending window. Um, my window uh, task is over. Press any key to exit or something like that. Okay. So there's our complete code, hopefully. Let's see if it runs. Just so you guys get a sense of a very, very basic, not very good psychophysics task, right? So I'm gonna play some pairs of tones. Test to tell me if the same or different pitch. Okay. Oh, okay, our first bug. Uh, so what, anybody got a guess as to what I uh, did wrong here? This is line 20 in psychophysics functions. Anybody have a clue as to why I'm getting that error? 
Okay, yes, I did not yet import psychopy.sound. So I forgot to do that. So now it should be able to access psychopy.sound. Same or different? Sorry, podcast listeners, that's going to be loud and obnoxious. All right, so is that same or different pitch as far as you can tell? Same, probably, yeah. Correct. Same or different? Correct. Oh, this is boring. Ah, same or different? Different. I think those are the same. Oh, okay, right. All right, so there's a very dumb basic psychophysics task with, with uh, keyboard input, okay? So, again, there's not too much new here, but um, hopefully as we go through these things, you guys might be picking up new little tricks and stuff as we go along, like the random dot random thing. Um, but what we're going to do, so let's take a little break now, um, and when we cease breaking, uh, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about adding in timing, we're going to change this from a sound task to a visual psychophysics task. And we're going to make it a little bit better and, and incorporate things like recording response times. And what we're going to try to do over the next class or two is um, make this into more of a full-featured like psychophysics style task. Okay. All right, so any questions or anything before we take a little breaky break? So let's resume. Um, here we go. So let's talk a little bit about what we actually had on the schedule for today, which is... Um, we said we're going to talk about time and keyboard input. And uh, sort of the good news for you guys is there's not too much new information. The bad news is um, to use this information is going to require some sophistication in the kind of code you write. So um, you're not going to have to learn a lot of new functions and objects and things like that, but you will will have to start learning how to write cleverer code. Uh, so so this is, again, it's going to play into the next couple of problem sets. and really learning the logic behind why we do things, not just how to like make a picture appear on the screen and so forth, but to actually start thinking about how the computer runs and what the consequences of certain code structures are and so forth. Um, so time is obviously important, hopefully, you know, to all of us. Uh, it controls things like us living for a period of time and then not being alive anymore and pretty much everything in our lives, right? In cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience, uh, precise timing is actually extremely important. So you guys have maybe already talked about this a fair bit with regard to like E prime and stuff like that, but probably most of you, with the exception of maybe some of your final year projects, have not really had to worry about super precise timing before in the things that you've done. Um, or at least you've let E prime take care of it for you. But if you ever have to do something like EEG or fMRI, you really have to worry about how well your task is synchronized to the device that you're recording with, right? Because like an EEG uh, typically records at about maybe 500 hertz or you know 500 samples every second, but it can go up to 1,000 hertz or more, um, or you know be as little as 250 hertz or like 100 hertz or something like that. Um, but typically about 500 times a second is what you're looking at with EEG which means that every two milliseconds you're recording brain data, right? Which means that if your task, you know, if you're trying to match up something that happens in your task with a brain recording, you would ideally like to know what's happening with about two milliseconds worth of precision, right? Because you want to align your task properly with the recording of what was happening in the person's brain. Um, and in EEG, you know, uh, two conditions may have a a latency difference in the brainwave of only five or six milliseconds if that's what you're measuring. So you really care about what's happening at the millisecond level with an EEG task, right? Now, if you ever if you ever do fMRI, you may know if you're taking, well, if you've learned some about neuroimaging, I guess nobody's taking Kirsten's class this year, um, but you would know that, you know, fMRI is acquired much more slowly, like you only get an fMRI image every two seconds, but the thing that you may not have been told about fMRI is Although it's a little bit slow getting the brain image, you get a brain image exactly every two seconds. Like, it's not two seconds in a little bit. It is, I mean, it can be other values, but if it says it's getting a, a brain image every two seconds, it is really like down to microseconds every two seconds, which is important because another thing you have to be worried about in fMRI, well, maybe if the brain image is only acquired every two seconds, you don't care so much if your stimulus comes on 
20 milliseconds late. But what you do care about is if every stimulus comes on 20 milliseconds late and you have uh, 500 stimuli in your task, then that's going to be, your task is going to be off its synchronization with the scanner by 10 seconds at the end of the run, right? And that's hugely out of sync. So there are different issues that you run into with EEG versus fMRI. EEG is more important that you time lock each individual stimulus and know exactly when it happened on the EEG recording. With fMRI, the individual stimuli don't matter as much, but you want to make sure there's not drift of your timer relative to the fMRI timer um, throughout the course of the task. But they're both, it's really important to know what's going on in your task at like a millisecond level of precision. Um, you also, of course, want to measure, if you're measuring response times, you want to measure those accurately, right? Now, this is not, it's not super critical if there's a little bit of error in your response times because you figure law of averages, there's noise anyway and everything, different people, you know, respond differently and so forth. But, of course, the more precisely you respond, your, uh, measure your response times, the fewer subjects you'll have to run. So it often makes sense, you know, if you can squeeze out uh, an extra few milliseconds of precision out of your response times, that may mean that you get an effect in, you know, a sample of 10 participants or 15 participants instead of having to run 30 or 40 participants. So, uh, you know, it really helps you with your power if you can measure everything very accurately. And there are a lot of cognitive effects that simply don't work if your timing is not exactly right. So if you're doing something like uh, masked priming, for example. So this is where like I flash a word on the screen and then cover it with X's and the word is only up for like 50 milliseconds. You can't read the word, but you can still be unconsciously primed by that word. Have you guys done talked about mask priming before ever? Anybody familiar with this? Or, or any sort of masking paradigm where you show something and then take it away very quickly. You know, you need to make sure that that um, stimulus is really only on screen for 50 milliseconds because it needs to be on screen just long enough for your eyes to process it a little bit and your brain to process it a little bit, but not long enough for you to consciously be aware of it, right? And so that, that really only works within a very narrow time window of a few milliseconds between uh, when your eyes are able to detect the, the thing printed on the screen and when uh, you become conscious of it. Now, a little side story is that I had a lab mate who um, was running an experiment on mask priming on an old, on an, an old Mac, like like 1990s era Mac, using this very old stimulus presentation software that I hate, that I refuse to ever use. Um, but she was getting great results in this mask priming paradigm, uh, and she had told it to, you know, told the images to be on screen for like 40 milliseconds or something like that. And then she switched to another computer and wasn't getting results, even though she was using the exact same experiment file. Well, she came to find out that we, we actually went and tested the hardware. Like, so we got one of these photo sensors and recorded when the stimuli actually appeared on the screen using a light sensor. And we found out that even though the stimulus software was reporting in, on one computer that the stimuli were lasting 40 milliseconds, they were actually lasting like 80 milliseconds or something like that, which is a huge difference, right? So uh, that's just a lesson that if you're if you're not using good software, or in our case for this class, if you're not writing good software, you know, your task could lie to you and tell you that uh, your timing is different than it actually is. And that could have a really big difference as to whether or not you find an effect. So these things, it's all really, basically the, the moral is for all these reasons, uh, it is often really important that you get your timing as precise as possible, okay? So this is the background for what we're doing today. So, uh, the good news is we've already used a lot of this stuff before, so the time-related functions that you'll ever use, or objects that you'll ever use, are in this module psychopy.core, and you guys have imported this module before, um, and we've actually used one timekeeping function already, the psychopy.core.wait. Um, and you answered the question in problem set three, uh, most of you pretty well, as to what psychopy.core.wait does, but uh, basically what it does is it just does nothing for a certain amount of time, right? So it takes, psychopy.core.wait takes one argument, which is called sex. Uh, it actually can take two arguments, but the only one we care about is sex, uh, which is, you know, often the case. Um, uh -huh. But uh, basically what it does is nothing, but it does that nothing for an extremely specific amount of time. Okay, so when you tell uh, psychopy.core.wait to wait for, you know, 2.5 seconds, 
in theory, if everything is working right, it should wait for exactly 2.5000 seconds, not 2.51 seconds, not 2.4149 seconds, right? Um, so the key thing is that it waits for a very specific amount of time and does nothing during that time except just sort of, you know, wait for the next thing to happen. But this is important, right? Because if you've, like, in a task where you've already put your stimulus on screen and you don't need to draw the next one yet, you know, you have to just kind of sit around and wait until the next one goes. Um, and that's where you use scikit-pi.core.wait. Um, okay, so, I mean, you know, this is a big difference to talk about, right? So, the, the, like, uh, the example I use is, you know, if, if you're just sitting around somewhere um, doing nothing in particular, and your friend says, what are you doing? And you say, well, I'm doing nothing. That's all well and good. But if you have psychopi.core.wait, what it's doing, it's like, I'm going to wait for another 1.873 seconds, right? So it's very specific about how long it's doing nothing for, whereas most of the time, as humans, we are not that specific. Okay. Um, the only other thing you'll need from psychopi.core to do timing is this clock object, okay? So there's really only a couple things that we need to use to do timing. Then what we have to do is be clever about how we record and, um, and behave with regard to timing. So these clock objects are, of, of all the objects that we've used so far, they're probably the easiest to create. You just create them. You don't need to give them any uh, arguments or parameters. You just say psychopi.core.clock, and you set that uh, to, you know, you set my clock as a variable to be equal to it, or whatever you want to call it, you know, whatever you want to call your clock uh, object. So you create a new one just like that with no parameters or anything. And it really only has one method that you particularly need to know, which is called get time. Okay? So if you create a clock and you call this method get time, what it gives you, so it has one, it has an output argument, and it gives you the time in seconds since it was created. Okay? So what this means is in theory, if you want, um, you could have different clock objects that all started at different times. It's like having different stopwatches that you hit the start button on at all different times. Um, and each one, whenever you ask it to, will give you a very precise, now I'd say it means in seconds because those are the units, but it gives you a lot of decimal points after the, after the uh, unit. So it'll give you the time in seconds since that clock object was created. So one very common thing you will do is create a clock object at the beginning of your task and then check it periodically to see how many seconds have elapsed since the beginning of your task, right? And again, if you're doing, like, for example, if you're doing an fMRI task, um, what you might want to do is usually your uh, computer is connected to the scanner via some sort of uh, wire or trigger. So when that signal comes in from the scanner, what you would do is create a clock object and say, all right, it's time zero right now. And if you want to make sure your trials start exactly every 12 seconds, say, what you're going to want to do is ask that clock object, is it, you know, has it been 12 seconds yet? All right, time to start the next trial. It, has it been 24 seconds? Start the next trial, right? So this clock is extremely, just like, um, just like weight, uh, this clock is extremely precise. So it'll give you usually better than millisecond precision um, in how long it has been. All right, so that's, that's good to know. So this is really the only method of get time uh, you'll need to know. So, uh, or sorry, this is the only method of the clock object you'll need to know. So it's, so far the code really simple. So that's the good news, is that what you actually have to do to wait a certain amount of time and to ask what time it is in your tasks, uh, in your tasks world, basically, is super simple. And, like I said, the times are very precise. There's some bad news that comes with this. So one of them is, that means that if you're writing your own code, it's up to you to keep track of when things happen yourself and to ask this clock object what time it is at the appropriate uh, points in your script, and to make, for example, variables that keep track of when things happened, maybe keep those things in lists, so you might have a list of when all your stimuli uh, came on screen. So it's up to you to keep track of this with your own code. So you're gonna have to be a little bit clever about your code as to how you use these things, even though the things themselves are very uh, simple. Okay, so that's some of the bad news. Uh, there's more bad news. So I really hate it, by the way. If you ever, if you ever do uh, science for long, you'll find a lot of people, whenever they have good news and bad news type information, they overuse the good, the bad, and the ugly metaphor. Uh, but this is a case where it's actually true. So there's more bad here. 
so the bad continues, which is that um, most of the hardware that you will use if you continue on in psychology research uh, will not actually be able to time things as precisely as PsychoPy is able to report time to you. So PsychoPy, like your computer processor, runs at, you know, uh, at this point probably a couple of gigahertz, right? So your processor is doing something a couple billion times a second. You, it has information about how long the computer has been on, for example, that gets into far below the microsecond level. So your computer, in theory, can time stuff you know, down to millionths of a second, which you know, is far more precisely than we need for um, brain-type stuff or, or psychological stuff. But things like your monitor only changes its image 60 times a second, right? So most of your LCD screens here are uh, only able to change the image every 60, uh, well, every 16.6667 milliseconds. So even if you know exactly what time it is, you can't necessarily change the image right at that time. You might have to wait 15 milliseconds to change the, up, to change the image on the monitor. So if you want to really precisely time stimuli, you either have to get a really fancy monitor that can update like at 100 hertz or 120 hertz or something like that, or you just have to deal with this. And actually, uh, with an LCD screen, it's actually even worse than this because uh, you don't know exactly, even if you claim the image comes on screen at a certain time, it actually takes maybe four or five milliseconds for the pixels to kind of warm up. So there's actually a little bit of error in addition to it being a little bit slow. Um, so that's one piece of bad news about your keyboard. I mean, sorry, about your monitor. Also, your keyboard and your mice and things like that, anything that connects via USB um, is subject to timing and accuracies of several milliseconds, usually only like five milliseconds or something like that, but it's still going to be unpredictable by five or ten milliseconds. So there's a certain upper limit to the precision that you can record responses. Um, and the other bad news is because we use nowadays Windows or the Mac OS, and we don't use like DOS, um, back in the good old days when DOS existed, you could literally only run one program at a time, right? So if you ran a program, that program was the only thing going on in your computer until it exited and returned you to like that text prompt, right? Nowadays, um, we're able to multitask, right? So you can have, if you want, I don't recommend this when you're doing like your family, your projects, but if you want, while you're running your ePrime task, you can also have like a browser playing a video in the background and you can have Excel open, you can have Word open, you can have your email collecting emails in the background, and you could be doing a virus scan all at the same time as you're actually running your task, right? But the problem is all these different processes are competing for your CPU time. And because of the way computers do multitasking now, um, you can't, your task is not allowed to become all that selfish with regard to the CPU time. So you can't guarantee when you're running on a modern operating system that at some point Windows is not going to just say, oh, you know, I need to give this antivirus software like 300 milliseconds to do its thing, and I'll let you do your thing after that, right? Which then throws your timing way, way off, okay? So that's something to keep in mind. Now, you can minimize this, like, if you know, if you're really serious about timing, you'll usually, um, you know, install a bare operating system, just plain Windows, not all the crap that they install, you know, on the, when, the, when you buy the computer, and... You, won't, you definitely won't install any antivirus software because it's the worst, um, you know, with regard to taking time unexpectedly. And you will only run one program at a time, but still Windows might, do, might decide it's time to, like, check for updates or something in the background. So uh, you have to be aware that it's possible, even if you code your task up perfectly, that Windows is just going to, like, or, or Mac OS, if you're using a Mac, is just going to, you know, stick its face in and mess, mess around when you have some really... Uh, timing critical thing going on. So you have to be aware that um, it's always possible that the operating system could completely mess up your timing. So that's the bad. Uh, here's the ugly. Here's the bad thing about time is that if you get old enough due to time, you end up talking to just a chair instead of being in a cool cowboy movie. Um, so the ugly part of all this is um, there are even limits to how accurately you can know certain things. So unless you have a... a fancy graphics card, by which I mean the kind that you would use to play games, like a separate graphics card, not just the one that came built into your PC. Unfortunately, PsychoPy can't even tell you for sure what time your screen is refreshing. So if you have a good graphics card, it can tell you, like, 
to the to less than a millisecond precision, okay, a new frame just came on screen. But with a regular graphics card, like is in all of our lab PCs, um, and pretty much all the PCs on campus except for the EEG lab, or unless you have like a gaming PC or something like that, or a Mac, um, you probably don't have a good enough graphics card um, to, to know this information. So what you can do is you can tell PsychoPie, all right, I think it's about time for a new frame to come on. Please update the screen. And PsychoPie will tell your monitor to put something new on the screen, but you don't get any confirmation back from the video card that it actually came on screen at the time you asked for it. So that's a little concerning, although for most of the stuff we're doing in this class, it's not that concerning. Um, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, so what you know, basically, with PsychoPie, if you don't have a nice graphics card, is if you know your screen is refreshing every 16 or so milliseconds, you know that probably your stimulus came on screen within 50, you know, 15 or 16 milliseconds of when you requested it, but you don't know exactly when in there it came on screen, and you don't know for sure, you don't know for sure uh, that it did come on screen at that time at all. I'm gonna just close the windows here. Are there any other windows open? This may sadly affect the podcast. Thanks. Um, okay, so so that's the ugly news is that, um, and this is not not just PsychoPie's fault. I mean, this is a problem with graphics cards in general. So uh, there's a certain amount of limitation as to how precisely you can get information, even if you do it all exactly right. Uh, so my analogy is, you could you know. Since you don't get any feedback from your video card as to when the stimulus came on screen, uh, you think you're showing stimuli to a participant at a particular time, but you could just basically be talking to an empty chair. You could just be, you know, throwing stuff out there that never gets put on screen. You don't ever know for sure that it happens the way you think it should. Okay. Now, the silver lining to all of this is the good news for you guys and, and your work in this class is if you can't know anything too precisely, your code can be a little bit simpler because when you get really super paranoid about making sure that your stimuli come on at a certain millisecond, the code gets a little more complicated. For you guys, it's going to be a little bit complicated just to ensure that your timings are approximately right, but it's not as complicated as it will be if you really want to ensure millisecond precision. Uh, and you can count on the fact that if you're doing basically the right thing where you're not running any other processes at the same time as your task and all that stuff, you can be sure that your timing is probably reasonably accurate. Okay. Uh, one last thing about keyboard input. So the good news is we've actually already used one of the main functions you guys are going to want to do for keyboard input, which is this wait keys, psychopi.event.wait keys function. So you've already used that to find out what key someone has typed. So that's good, you already know half of what we need to know about keyboard input. Uh, but a lot of the time, of course, if we're doing reaction time stuff, we wanna know when someone hit the key also, right? So our main focus for today is how to integrate things like uh, this wait keys function with our timing information um, to calculate things like response times, okay? Um, now, there is one other keyboard input function that's worth knowing about. It's called segobite.event.getkeys. So whenever you want to find out like what keys people are hitting, you're going to want to do one of these two things depending on what your job is. So the difference between these two functions is um, segobite.event.waitkeys, uh, wait key as you guys have found already, sits there and does nothing until someone hits a key, right? So that's fine if like you put your stimulus up on the screen and it needs to stay there until the person responds. But if you want to do maybe other things at the same time, you might want to use this get keys, which basically tells you what keys are pushed down at this exact moment in time and immediately gives you that information. So uh, this is useful, for example, um, if you want to be doing other things, but also checking for key presses. So like maybe you maybe you want to have a stimulus that changes every you know 50 milliseconds, but you want to check for a key press throughout the time that those stimuli are changing, you can't just sit around and wait for a key press because you want to also be doing other things while you're waiting for a key press. So what you do is update the stimuli, 
called get keys a few times to check to see if the key is pressed down yet. If it's not, you update the stimulus again, call get keys a few more times, and so on and so forth, right? And you would do the same thing if you wanted to be sending signals to like your EEG or your eye tracker or something like that. So if you need to be communicating um, with your other hardware at the same time that you're uh, getting keyboard input, you might need to use get keys instead. And it gets a little more complicated then. Um, we maybe won't worry, about, well, we definitely won't worry about this today. I might put a little bit of get keys stuff on your problem set for you to get uh, used to that. Okay, uh, now of course the other way you can get input is from your mouse. Um, but mice are a little bit more complicated, so um, we're not gonna do mice, I don't think, in this class. But they're not so complicated that you couldn't do it on your own. So for example, if you wanted to do a, uh, a project that involved like mouse clicks instead of keyboard input, that would be a totally good thing to incorporate into your project to like learn on your own because it's not that much more difficult. Okay, um, so our goal now with whatever time we have left, which I think is not very much, um, yeah, it should be to modify our psychophysics demo to add in the timing and keyboard stuff. But I think probably in between the, uh, the weed eating in the background and the lack of time, maybe what we'll do is we'll put off the demo of the timing and keyboard stuff until the beginning of next time and kind of then do a little bit of timing and keyboard next time uh, and a little bit of files and then do finish up files and stuff in the last class this semester rather than try to do 10 minutes where I try to talk over the uh, weed eater there. So uh, maybe we'll do it this time. So we'll save uh, save the, uh, the keyboard and timing, the exciting stuff of doing the demo till next time. And... Um, you know, maybe I won't ask you any keyboard and timing stuff on this next problem set, so uh, so we can finish that up next time. Okay, so any questions about any of that so far?